what I did want to acknowledge, I guess, is that um, this the, the project that I'm going to be talking about was a collaboration with the um, with the government. Um, we uh, worked very closely with um, people like Brian Briscoe, who have developed the, the methodology, and uh, Torsten um, Gelsetter, I guess, who um, also um, was with CCRS at that time, but now he's, um, I think, at the University of Calgary, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, this was a, um, a collaboration between private industry and, uh, and government agencies, and uh, just wanted to show that, uh, that working together, we can sort of put together a sort of operational system, because there's a lot of talk about the theory that's required and all that sort of stuff, and I leave that to you academics and uh, government agency types, and then there's the sort of actually taking that out and making it into an operational system. So I just wanted to talk about it sort of in, in, in very broad, broad terms. Um, we were given the um, opportunity to develop a system for uh, Parks Canada. It was uh, funded by the Canadian Space Agency. And basically what it was to do was an operational uh, um, water extent mapping capability. And so in broad strokes, there's sort of two major uh, components. The first component is basically the how do you sort of establish what the threshold is going to be for water. So as we all know, water is um, a specular um, reflector. You've got the radar shooting out a pulse of energy. It hits the water. It acts kind of like a mirror, and all the energy sort of bounces off into la-la land. So about the only thing we know for sure right now is that the backscattering from water is probably going to be fairly low. So we have that kind of a, as a starting point. So the first thing we want to do is establish some sort of nominal threshold between the land and the water. And so obviously, we need to have an image that has some land and water in it. We want to do some statistical uh, processing, and we want to be able to separate the two. And then once we have some idea, and this is, this is only done to get an uh, initial guess, once we have an, um, some idea of what that threshold is, we go to a backscattering model. Okay, This was developed, I think, um, what well, was modified in Canada. I think Paris Vachon worked on it quite a bit. And it's basically a backscattering model where when we know the um, when we know the incidence angle and we know the wind speed and we know the look direction relative to the radar, we've developed these models that give us some idea of what the backscattering is going to be for C-band data. So that's very good. The problem is is that we have the opposite problem, or at least we PCI had the opposite problem. What we did know is the backscattering, and we knew the incidence angle, and from that we have to estimate wind speed and uh, wind direction. So basically what we've done is we've taken the, the backscattering model for water and kind of worked it in inverse. And last but not least, once we have some idea of what the, backscat uh, sorry, what the wind speed and wind direction is, as you're aware, um, radar data is acquired at a broad range of incidence angles, and so we want to make those adjustments for that. And I'll go through each of those in a little bit. So now we've done the first part, we've done the modeling, we've done some fancy statistical processing, we're trying to do best fits, maximum likelihood, all that sort of stuff, and I was told that you guys were dumb as a bag of hammers, and that's not true, but uh, so, so I wanted to, I stayed away from all the math, and I kind of regret it now, but anyway, so we've, we've got this, we've got this whole thing. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that Brian told me that. But, or, anyway. So we've got, this, we've got this idea now of what constitutes a water pick. So we have some idea of, of what its backscattering value is going to be. And there's a lot of things that affect it. But it's kind of like you know, that story of when the dog chases a car. I mean, once you've got this thing, what are you going to do with it? So you know, knowing that there's something that might be a water pixel at line 37, pixel 48, isn't terribly useful to you. I mean, yeah, okay, you've got a pretty picture, but that's as far as you've gone. So the bottom line is kind of what I call sort of the cleanup mode, okay? Once you've got an idea of what, of what a water pixel might be, then you've got to go through a bunch of processes to basically turn that into useful information. So what we were talking about before with having metadata and all that sort of stuff, it's very important, okay? It's, it's one thing to have an image, but it's more important to extract information from that image, convert it into a nice map. It's all geocoded, however you want. You can compare it to last year's data set. You can compare it to next year's data set. So basically the idea is, you know, Canada's done a great job in develop an MDA in particular, have done a great job in developing a great radar. And what we want to do is extract the maximum amount of information that we can from this. And to do that, you need the academic sort of um, 
approach. You need the operational approach, which is where private companies like, like mine come from. So, so the bottom step is basically is if you have a DEM, we're going to convert it to a map projection, whatever you like. And of course, there's always a few problems. You've got to eliminate some of the false positives that come along. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about how we do that. And last but not least, you want to convert it to some sort of vector-based polygon system that you can export to other GIS systems. So basically, the exchange of the data and all that sort of stuff is extremely important. OK, so what could possibly go wrong? Well, as I, as I said before, um, radar backscattering is affected by uh, surface roughness, which is due to wind. So normally, when there's no wind at all, water's nice and smooth. Radar data hits it, bounces off into la-la land. But as, a, as the wind speed starts to pick up, you get these capillary waves that are kind of act like little mirrors that reflect back to the radar. So you get a much brighter backscattering from the radar. So here I've, I've shown a, a diagram of um, a land and water histogram. And what we're trying to do, of course, is find that threshold, because our first thing is to try to guess what the wind speed is. And um, as you can see, when you're at about two meters per second or fairly slow, very low wind speed, your water and land are, are quite nicely separated. And it's quite easy to find a threshold that you would guess as your first wind speed estimate. But as the wind starts to pick up, um, you get about 10 or 12 meters per second, that water histogram starts to slide into the area where, where the land is. And getting the threshold is still possible, but you're going to see you're going to get a lot more ambiguous sort of pixels here where you, where you really don't don't know whether they're land or water because it kind of falls into both both areas. So anyway, so this is this is kind of the, the first problem that we encounter. So here I just wanted to show you a picture of, of two data sets that are acquired. This happens to be X-band data. It's not radar set data, but it, it's here for illustrative purposes. And uh, this is taken off the coast of Italy. The um, uh, probably a nice place to be. When I was putting this together, I was thinking about Italy and California and all these places. So. Anyway, the idea is that um, on the left-hand image, we have a nice calm day, low wind speed. And you, and you can see that, you know, I mean, anybody can figure out the difference between the land and the water there. It's pretty, pretty obvious. But exactly the same data set, the land's roughly the same. Um, backscattering capability, you can see that as the, wa as the wind speed starts to pick up, the water starts to get a little brighter. Okay? So again, I'm just trying to illustrate what, what the sort of problems are. So that first guess is to try to get um, a threshold estimate of what the wind speed is. Okay, and there's, there's one other effect that we really have to worry about, and that's the effect of incidence angle. Now, this one's a little more subtle than, uh, than the first one, because in the first one, when I, when I showed you the previous slide, here you can see the land doesn't move. It's the water that shifts. Well, the backscattering histogram shifts. But here, they, they kind of both, uh, both shift. Uh, as you look at different incidence angles, the backscattering that you would get from land and water both changes, and they change at different rates. So on the top one here, we have a very steep incidence angle. So you sort of think of sending pulse and energy sort of almost straight down. A lot of that energy is going to come bouncing back at you. Whereas if you send it at a further, a st uh, steeper incidence angle, more of that energy is going to bounce away. So here at 23 degrees, roughly, uh, we can see again that the water and the land are a little bit harder to separate. And uh, here at 45 degrees, it's, it's a little bit easier to do. Okay. So again, I was on my vacation mode. It's been a long, long winter in, uh, in um, Ottawa. So I got this picture off the coast of California. I know it doesn't look like much, but uh, all I wanted to illustrate here is the effective incidence angle. So this is calibrated data. That's, that's one thing I did forget to mention, that um, we've converted it to sigma naught. MDA does a very good job of giving you all the um, all the uh, parameters that you need to be able to do that. And this happens to be um, UAVSAR data. And again, I, I use it for illustrative purposes only because it has a very wide range of incidence angles. But you can see that at the left there, um, you're getting very bright backscattering. As, you, as the incidence angle increases, you're getting darker and darker return. And so we have to be able to separate those two phenomena. So, okay, so now we've done this. We've done all the statistical measurement. We've, we've estimated where the threshold is. We've uh, got some kind of idea of the best fit and the wind speed. And from that, we then estimate what the 
backscattering is going to be at all the different incidence angles. So we know the incidence angle, we know all this information that we need, and basically all we do is we flag out all the, in, all the pixels that fall within that, that category. Now there's one other little caveat that I didn't mention before this, <coughs> and that is that we have an exclusion in terms of size, okay? So when we find these quote, quote, water bodies, what we want to do is make sure that they exceed a certain size when they're clustered together because um, tomorrow we'll talk about it a little bit more, but radar is drastically affected by speckle, and when you've got speckle, of course, you don't want to pick out all of these, all these little single pixels that, that definitely fall below the threshold, I mean, here. So basically what we do is, in the processing, we identify some size that's required to do that. So after that, of course, it's just a question of extracting the edges. Um, again, fairly straightforward. Uh, don't worry about it, we do smooth these edges, but basically all I, I wanted to show here is that we, we, can uh, we can convert them into polygons, which are easily exported to other systems. Okay, so this is, uh, this is kind of the result that we get. This is Crow Flats. I think it was already shown this morning. Um, as you can see, um, we just give it a data set. It basically automatically determines what the wind speed is, determines what the look direction is, um, and tries to estimate what, where the bodies of water is. Now this whole process here to generate this, oops, to generate this image took about uh, a minute and a half. Okay, so if you want to digitize it by hand, be my guest, but, uh, but uh, the idea is that once you've read in the data and run the process, it, it does take about a minute and a half. Okay, so now we've got these polygons and, the, and they're out there, but they're still sort of in image space and we have to, we have to um, correct them. So one of the things that, uh, that, we, that we talked about again this morning was that we do carry the metadata with us. So we have a very good idea of where the radar is. We know this, we read the state vectors, so, so knowing where the radar is, is is not a big problem. And then, oops, Nancy. But what we, what we do want to do is we want to correct it and we need a, a digital elevation model to be able to do that. Okay, so if the world was nice and flat, you'd get this kind of image that, you, that we have on the left-hand side. Um, once, you, once you read in a DEM, of course, you, you can see that the, the foreshortening is, is fixed, uh, the shadows are increased, and basically you have now a, uh, a map product. So we've got all these polygons that are in image space and we're going to convert them into uh, map space now. Okay, um, obviously it's going to depend a lot on the DEM that you used as input. So uh, freely available is the shuttle uh, radar topographic mission uh, data that comes out of DLR in, in Germany. It's 90 meter resolution, fairly coarse. And at the opposite extreme, you've got the LiDAR data, and I put that in for you LiDAR guys. I, I don't know anything about LiDAR, apart from the fact that we can read it in. But there's, a, there's an example of some data that, that we do use for testing, and, and so it's, I think it's 25 meter resolution. So basically the idea being that if you're going to process this stuff, you've got a wide range of data that you can use. The results are going to depend on the data that you use as input. So if you use a very high resolution DEM, you'll get much better results than if you use a very coarse resolution DEM. And I mean, that's kind of obvious, I think. But uh, so, so once we run the program, here we go, we, we, we read in this, this data set, like I said, about a minute and a half, you get this pretty picture with all these little red blobs on it. And as you will see fairly quickly, these ones, are, these ones up here are a little suspicious. And what's happened is they are below the threshold as we expected, but they're, they're caused by shadow. So we said, well, we're fairly clever guys. We know we had a DEM, we know where the, um, where the elevation, uh, we know the slope of the, the local elevation, and so it was fairly, fairly straightforward to just create a, a little module that basically lets the user identify whatever slope they want to they wanna use as sort of a, a threshold. And what we did here, or what I did here is, and I, I set it to five degrees, and the area that is, that has a slope greater than five degrees, and this is a very coarse DEM, by the way, uh, shows up as green. Everything else is this sort of dark purplish kind of color. Um, all, of the, all of the little targets that were identified on slopes of greater than five degrees will be eliminated. Makes sense, you don't generally find lakes and water bodies on the side of mountains, so it's not a good idea. And everything else that's left is kind of this, this light blue color. Okay? So basically, it's just a quick way to remove some false positives and, uh, and it's a very simple, simple process. 
Okay, so that's, so that's what you end up with. We, uh, we have an algorithm to smooth the curves so that you just get rid of those jaggy little edges. That's just more aesthetically pleasing. And the idea is, is also that you can convert it to a, a Esri shape file or any kind of GIS supported file and makes it easy to export to other systems. <coughs> So here we have a rapid eye image of, um, of the uh, crow flat area. Um, it's not acquired coincidentally with the radar sat data. You can see some ice is starting to form on, on some of these bigger lakes, I think. Or maybe it's left, I guess it's actually left from, from, uh, from the winter. And when we ran the, our program and we eliminated the uh, false water bodies, this is what we got. So just so you can kind of compare there. And it seems to do a fairly accurate job. Seems to work fairly rapidly. Uh, again, we did just overlaid it on a map. We got fairly good results. So it seemed to work out quite well. So that's, that's kind of the overview of the process without going into any of the math. And of course, there's always some side benefits that come out of these things. And this is one of the, the nice ones. Uh, the, the white boundaries show the original um, Canvec uh, water body um, um, vector files, and what we did here is this is a lake in the in the in the Crow Flats area that has been drained apparently, and you can see quite readily what the uh, what the change in surface area is. Okay, so this thing is highly um, repeatable. Um, unlike some of the INSAR stuff, we don't need to wait the 24 days. Any incidence angle, any range of incidence angles works. So you can you can acquire data however you want. So if it's critical that you get it on a daily basis, you can do that. Um, it's, um, you know, because we do all the ortho, uh, we do all the ortho rectification for you. So we don't care what the incidence angle is. It's just based on the backscattering. So this is a really, really kind of nice feature about um, um, being able to detect changes in, in water body size. To show you how simple this thing is, is to do, even your kids could probably run this thing. It's really straightforward. I mean, you just got it. This is, this is the GXL, which is an operational system. We also have a, a lower level called Geomatica, which you'd have to run one at a time. But basically, you just have to point to an input directory that has all your files. And again, they don't, they don't have to be the same incidence angle or anything like that. We just sort of say, OK, we can read that. Where do you want to put your data? Do you want to have it as PICs or GeoTIFF files or whatever the format is? Uh, <clears throat> this is sort of a protection thing. Do you, do you want to overwrite any results? You, you don't want to inadvertently give it the wrong files and then destroy something that you've spent a lot of time on. So this, that's just a protection thing. This is kind of uh, an interesting thing here. This, is, this all runs on the cloud. You can launch it from your phone. You could be in Europe and say, I'd like to process this data and send it to Bob, whoever Bob is, I don't know. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> but the idea, again, the idea is that you can launch this from a phone. It all works on the cloud. Okay? You can pre-filter the data if you want to. You can set the filter size. You don't have to, obviously. Uh, some of the filters require some knowledge of the number of looks. And I won't go into all that sort of stuff. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, do you want to eliminate false positives, yes or no? And if you do, what's the slope that you want to use? Do you want to throw away small body water, small bodies of water? Now, this is kind of interesting because we work in square meters, OK? So it makes it simple. You don't have to know whether you have coarse data or very fine data. So if you've got very coarse data, 100 by 100, that's one pixel. If you've got very fine data, one meter by one meter, that's 10,000 pixels. So the idea being that you're, that you're setting the water body size. What map units do you want? UTM, lat long, I don't care, it doesn't matter. Um, what size do you want for pixels? How do you want to resample the data? Where's your DEM coming from? Do you want to use the same units as the DEM? You know, and this is just for us, just in case there's areas, masked out areas that you don't want to use. So again, it, I, we think it's fairly intuitive. Um, like I said, I was able to process eight radar sat scenes in about a little less than 15 minutes, so about a minute and a half each, so, and they're each two or three gigs in size. So, so basically, the amount of processing you do is massive. It goes really, really fast. So if you want to run this thing, some very, very basic suggestions. Use the radar set to CHH data calibrated to sigma naught. I, I didn't mention that at the beginning. It does have to be calibrated to sigma naught because that's the, the model is based on that. If you can, try to acquire the data when the, when the wind is fairly calm. That's not always possible, but it gives you better results. Higher incidence angles give you better results. 
higher resolution DEMs give you better results. This is all intuitive stuff. We all know this. Uh, smooth polygons just give you aesthetically pleasing, more pleasing results. And as a general rule, you want to discard water bodies that are less than four or five pixels in size because, because of speckle, you, will, you, don't, you don't want to get too many false um, positive targets. So that's basically the water on, water off. I was just asked to briefly touch a, a little bit on ice on, ice off, which is kind of a slightly different problem. And um, it, it's kind of the same concept. And again, it, it's all very operational, except here, this only works on the GXL system. And the reason for that is that what we're doing now is we're actually going to look at the different dates at which these acquire. So the first thing was kind of you give it a data set and they could be totally independent of each other and you just process them one at a time. Here we've got a stack of data and I think Marco talked a little bit about it this morning. You know, you've got, you've got a whole whack of data and they're all roughly in the same area. So what we do first is we orthorectify the data to put them all into one coordinate system. Now this, and we ingest this, these water body shapes. And guess where we got them from? This in the previous, um, from, the, from the previous uh, model. So you can, you can import your own or you can run the ones that we just generated before. And then basically all we do, and I won't get into the math of this, is we classify every single pixel as being either water or ice or some sort of unknown and that's based on statistical properties of the data. And what happens here is the user can set a threshold. So for within each water body you can say, okay, if it's no more than 90% ice, then we'll call the lake frozen. If it's on, on the converse side, if it's more than 90% water, we'll call the lake thawed. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to run through a whole bunch of data sets all on the same, um, all over the same area. We're going to count the number of pixels inside of each polygon and if it exceeds some user defined threshold, we'll identify it as such. And last but not least, as part of the metadata, we extract the acquisition date that goes with that. So here's a very, very quick output sort of thing. So we've got a whole bunch of data there all stacked up, all um, co-registered. The, the yellow line here is just the, the boundary, so this all goes into a database and you can define your own, your own boundary and, and a lake has to be completely enclosed to get that. And then you can see that this is ice on sort of thing, so we're starting on the 25th of uh, September, going up to the 5th of October. When do these lakes exceed 90% of, um, of well, when were these lakes more than 90% uh, covered in ice? And as we, we can just sort of go through the dates and color code them. So you can see that the, um, the red ones here look like they, they froze last. The green ones here froze a little sooner than that. Some of these smaller bodies of water froze even earlier than that. So basically the idea being is that for climate change reasons and things like that, you can actually sort of track the, the, the date at which these things freeze and just well, obviously, you can go in the opposite direction as well. So some of the small water bodies that, that didn't get massed here, it's probably because they were thawed before we, we started processing this data. So, so again, you can see the small water bodies. But each lake has its own polygon, it has its own attributes, and this all goes into a huge database, and you can track the date at which they froze and which they thawed and all that sort of stuff. So it, it's basically a fully operational system, and, uh, and it can be tailored to whatever you want it want it to do. And again, very simple input, output, na the name of your water body file, which may have been generated from the previous way, or you can bring in your own data set. Um, filter size, if you want to filter in advance. You have some control over the algorithm that actually delineates whether it's ice or water or unknown, and I won't get into any of that sort of stuff, but basically there's a number of parameters that, that you define. And last but not least, of course, is your DEM source if you want to orthorectify the data. So that's basically it. Uh, my marketing guys make me put that slide up there. I don't know why. I'm not, uh, I'm not really a, a marketing kind of guy. But in an operational sense, like I said, we, uh, we can take radar data. We can process it fairly quickly. We can project it to any standard form that you want. So if you like, if you like vector data, that's fine. If you like raster data, that's fine too. Um, it's a very malleable system, um, pretty much under your own control. We can read DEMs different resolutions. The results depend on the input data, obviously, and there's some things to watch out for.